Uh, recently, Frank Turek was interviewed uh, by Capturing Christianity, and the first question that the viewers wanted to know, now, uh, Capturing Christianity's viewers tend to be young, so I understand why this is an important question to them. But the first question happened to be uh, being a Christian and evolution, and do, can you believe in evolution and still believe that the Bible's the Word of God and so forth? And they talked for a little bit, and at one point of the interview, uh, Frank Turek pulled out the silver bullet against evolutionary creation. And uh, I'm going to share it with you now, and then we'll get uh, Dr. Venema to respond. And uh, this meeting was advertising the fact that the theory of neo-Darwinian evolution does not work. You can't so modify. That, so, that, so for anyone who may not know what yeah. neo-Darwinian evolution is, that's like what the two mechanisms, right? Natural selection and random mutation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then or natural selection acting on random mutations. Sure. You right. can't that's how take you a genetic code and modify it and get new body plants. You can modify yeah. it randomly mm -hmm. or even maybe even intelligently from now till doomsday, you'll never get a new body plant. Why? Why? Because DNA itself does not give you a new body plant. DNA codes for proteins, but to get a new body plan, you need another kind of information known as epigenetic information. Epigenetic information is the structure. To use an analogy, where here we are sitting in a beautiful chapel. Um, the software that designed this chapel will never give you the chapel. The software will give you the instructions on how to build the chapel, but in order to have the chapel, you need physical materials. You need concrete, you need nails, you need wood, you need, you know, all those things. You need a foundation. Hmm. That, when it comes to biology, the analogy there with biology is in epigenetic information, the structure of the cell is, is sort of like the structure of this chapel. Whereas the software, the DNA would be, the analogous part there would be the, 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 the uh, software program that came up with the blueprint for this particular okay. chapel. So modifying the software will not get you a chapel modifying dna will not get you a new body plan okay and dennis what's your response to that uh -huh. after watching the video i was like okay who is this guy i've never heard of frank turk before so googled around a bit i'm like okay probably doesn't have training in biology which is okay a lot of apologists don't um, yeah, doesn't have training in biology. Seems to have read a bunch of Stephen Meyer, um, you know, well-known ID proponent. You know, Stephen Meyer doesn't have a biological background either. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> where to even where to even start, right? Um, one of the things I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Turek there, you know, okay, define to me what you mean by a new body plan. You know, do fish, whales, you know, pterosaurs, you know, and humans, do we have the same body plan or do we have different body plans? Because I really don't know what level of organization he's really speaking to. Is he saying like, you know, everything that's a bilateral is the same body plan? So he's arguing that, you know, you can't get, you know, you can't modify DNA to go from like, say, something not bilateral to something that's bilateral. You know, I just don't know exactly what his argument is actually saying this idea though okay like if if he would say okay humans and you know pterosaurs have different body plans if he would say that then I would say okay then we have pretty good evidence from the fossil record and from comparative genomic analysis that there's no natural barrier that separates those body plans you can slowly traverse from one to the other through random mutation natural selection, genetic drift, and the other mechanisms that are part of, you know, common ancestry and part of evolution. So it really sort of depends on what level he's arguing at. Um, you know, would he say that humans and chimpanzees have the same body plan? Probably he would, although a lot of ID proponents, you know, recoil pretty strongly at the idea that, you know, humans and chimpanzees share a common ancestor. Well, if human and chim humans and chimpanzees share a common ancestor, and you know, if we look at their genetics, look at the DNA comparisons between them, you know, by any measure you use, humans and chimpanzees have incredibly similar DNA, right? North of 95%, even with the most, you know, 
sort of lax measures of means of comparison. And there's no biological mechanism that would prevent, you know, traversing from a common ancestor to these two body to these two organisms that we have in the present day, right? That's genetically trivial. That fits in exactly with the mutation rates that we see for organisms like that and the time scale that we see in the fossil record and by other measures for that divergence. So there's sort of no magic barrier between different species, different organisms, even, you know, different body plans. And in some cases, we have pretty good evidence for how body plans shifted over time. Like, say, for example, with whales, I talk about this um, quite a bit. I talk about it in the book. I talk about it on the Biologos um, articles about um, intro to evolution, evolution basics. Um, whales are tetrapods. They're four-limbed animals, just like any mammal should be. But they happen only to be tetrapods, only have four limbs early on in their embryological development. So we would expect that from an evolutionary perspective that they, because they come from a lineage that has four limbs, but in their adult form, they have front flippers and they have a tail. But early on in their embryological development, they make four limb buds and hind limb buds, just like any good tetrapod, any good mammal should. So, you know, and then there's these genetic programs that are, you know, are starting that development. And then there's other programs that come along later and shut it down in the hind limb area only. So we have a, a pretty good handle on how evolution, how genetic changes modified that body plan to go from a four-limbed terrestrial mammal to a two-limbed, as it were, aquatic mammal. So yeah, I guess I would want to have that conversation with Dr. Turek and just ask the questions like, okay, what level are you talking about? And why are these lines of evidence, like, why do they not seem to be relevant to what you're talking about? So... Is it surprising to you, given your debate or your dialogue with Nathaniel Jensen, is it surprising to you that the young earth creationists seem to be ahead of the game on new body plans than, than the ID <laughs> guys? Because didn't he concede in that dialogue when you asked him a question that there was a common ancestor for both sheep and, and cattle on the ark? Okay, another question. <clears throat> One thing as a biologist that I'm often curious about with the young earth literature is that many baramins or accepted groups of relatedness have DNA diversity within them that are actually far greater than human and even human and chimpanzee differences. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious why that is the case or how that, you know, how that fits in a young earth creationist model. If we can see mm -hmm. diversity in related groups that exceeds the human chimp difference, and from a young Earth perspective, that's a, happening in a very short period of time. Then why, you know, how is it that you that we can baromenologically, mm -hmm. reliably locate humans as not related to other mm -hmm. species? Well, what testable predictions does a model make? So if I can say, let's use mitochondrial DNA. Uh, if, and what, let me think of actually a better example, bovids. So, bovidae family, 135 species alive today. Everything from cattle to sheep to goats to African antelopes. Very diverse family. Uh, cows and sheep differ by 10% of their DNA, I think. So, 10 times higher than human ch chimpanzees. We'd say maybe they have a common ancestor. They're clean animals, so it might get a little sticky, but that's a side note. Uh, mitochondrial DNA, that's where I was going with this. So, there's maybe 2,000 differences between cattle and sheep. At the mitochondrial DNA level, humans versus chimpanzee, there's only 1,400. Humans versus humans, you saw the data, 80 to 40. So how do you explain the fact that you have cattle and sheep potentially sharing a common ancestor, but there are thousands of differences apart? Humans, we'd say, have a common ancestor and not related to anything else, less than 100. That'll probably be a function of DNA differences, mutation rates. So no one's measured the mutation rate in these bovid species. We can make testable predictions. Uh, and really that's what it's gonna come down to. So I would say, you know, we've made retrodictions for humans. We can make testable predictions for Khoisan peoples, other people groups in which it has yet to be measured. I can make predictions then for sheep and cattle. And the success of this model will be seen on how well those predictions bear out in reality. Miss, as a lay, as a lay person listening to you, I just wanna make sure if I understood what, you, what you're saying. Uh, are you saying that uh, on the ark, uh, there was a common ancestor for sheep and for cattle, and that sheep, potentially. Okay, you are. Is it, 
what's what's potentially mean? Just so I'll understand, are you saying then? For sake of argument, yes. But because they're clean, and then there's the question of seven of the clean, two of the unclean. Could it have been that there was three different looking representatives? I don't know. I'm just so for unclean cats would be easier example. Two two cats, and you have everything from tigers to house cats to jaguars in between. For, for my simple mind, uh, sheep and and cattle are are pretty dramatically different species. Mm -hmm. So whenever I hear someone saying that's a common that, that that they had a common ancestor, well, you know, you know, I got in trouble for, for everything I that I, I I thought about that. I thought that was quite a remarkable thing. So I just wanted to, to make sure I understood that. Yeah, one of the interesting things about young Earth creationism biology is that you have this necessity of getting um, all of biodiversity shoved onto an ark, you know, four thousand years ago. So. Obviously, that doesn't work very well if you're talking about present-day species. So what you have to have is these original created kinds, which are on the ark, and then you have this massive amount of macroevolution, for lack of a better word. You have this massive amount of speciation, such that, you know, all artiodactyls, so sheep and deer and goats and pigs, you know, they're all coming from a common ancestor on the ark. You know, all the different apes. Um, or other primates have common ancestors, you know, except for humans, right? Humans don't share in that. But I mean, that's an or that's an amount of speciation. That's an amount of macroevolution that is so rapid. I mean, if you think about, you know, they think this is what 4,300 years ago, and we've got millions of present-day species, and you have to have them coming, you know, speciating from these representative ancestors that were on the ark. You know, that's that's evolution on steroids. That's hyperevolution. So yeah, on the younger side of the equation, you see that, you know, more of a willingness to say that there's quite a bit of, of speciation going on, macroevolution going on. On the other hand, with the old earth creationist uh, side of the equation, and most ID folks tend to be old earth creationists, not all, but most, they're more comfortable, you know, they don't have that sort of pressure to have a huge amount of speciation going on because they've got all the time in the world, as it were. They don't have to shove it all, all this biodiversity onto an arc and have it uh, diversify from that rapid starting point. So yeah, you end up with this kind of ironic situation where you've got young Earth hyper-evolutionists and you've got old Earth very much anti-evolutionists. Although, you know, folks like Ken Ham or Nathan Nathaniel Jensen probably wouldn't like having that label, but that's what it is. If you look at it, it's, it's just massive amounts of evolution happening in an incredibly short period of time.